The Near Futurist, a podcast with Guy Clapperton. Hello, and thanks for downloading The Near Futurist, a show presented by me, Guy Clapperton. Today, I'm talking to someone about one of my pet subjects, the future of the workplace. I co-wrote a book about that a few years ago. First, though, the usual bit about who you're listening to. I'm Guy Clapperton, a technology journalist, event MC, and media trainer with over 30 years of experience. You might have heard me or seen me on the BBC occasionally, read some of my books, including The Smarter Working Manifesto, or perhaps seen me in The Guardian, New Statesman Tech, and elsewhere. I go to a lot of conferences, and I hear experts talking about their forecast about the decades to come. I'd rather use that 30 years experience of mine as a commentator to discuss what's likely to happen later this year, earlier next, and the action we need to take now. So I came up with the Near Futurist concept. Do please have a look at my website at nearfuturist.co.uk where you'll find more episodes and information on what we're about. If you'd like to book me as a speaker or MC for your technology event, please check the show reel on the site and drop me a line. Guy at nearfuturist.co.uk. That's nearfuturist as one word. Or get in touch with my agent, whose details are, of course, also on the site. And if you like what you're hearing on this podcast, please do consider leaving a review on the iTunes store or wherever you download from. And if you're new to the show, you're very welcome. Actually, if you're not new to the show, you're still very welcome. But that's more than enough blather about me. My guest today is the head of a major London hub for startup technology companies. I first came across this business several years ago when I was helping coach candidates for a startup technology company award for IBM. There's even a video of me talking about it on YouTube with darker hair, and this would be about three stone ago, I should think. And I'm back on the premises now. It's called Level 39. It's in Canary Wharf. My guest and indeed host for the day is Ben Braben. Ben, welcome to the Near Futurist podcast. Thank you. Uh, first, perhaps you could tell the listeners something about Level 39. My information is going to be well out of date. So uh, what is it and uh, why it's a cluster like this? Well, welcome back. So Level 39 is nearly seven years old now. It's right at the heart of Canary Wharf. We sit, perhaps a little unsurprisingly, on the 39th floor of One Canada Square, which is the for those of you who don't know, can I walk off the building with a pyramid top, which is visible all around London? But uh, this is really an environment in which early stage high growth companies can come right into the heart of the most productive region in Europe. So right at the heart of the UK financial services industry, we have now around about 200 companies in fintech, but also in cybersecurity, smart cities and retail technology and some other technologies that are kind of hard to categorize. But almost all of these companies are selling capabilities and expertise into global financial services firms. We have roughly 1,250 people from about 50 different countries coming together here. Right. I mean, that's uh, an awful lot of people. And it's also a spectacular place to work. I have to say, I'm looking out of the window now, and I was in your cafe a little while ago, looking out at the fog. (laughs) Unfortunately, it must be stunning when it's the summer, but this is what I get for visiting in January. I do come across an awful lot of technology hubs, whether they're attached to universities, there's stuff in Cambridge, for example, or whether wherever else they might be, there's, you know, Silicon Roundabout. This is another one with an awful lot of people from an awful lot of countries, as you say. Why do companies in the technology area, and I know that's a huge generation, uh, generalization. Why do they feel the need to cluster in this way? Well, I think there are two main drivers of the urge to cluster. And this is something which I think is fairly usefully uh, explored by Erko Ortio, who's an academic at Imperial College, who distinguishes between entrepreneurial clusters and innovation clusters. An entrepreneurial cluster is a cluster typically around a university or some center of excellence, where people share the need for resources, technology capabilities, uh, sometimes research facilities and so forth. So you will often find, for example, a cluster developing a a particular type of capability. Uh, It's worth considering how that is useful for the people who participate because they can collaborate on the supply side. They can collaborate on the development of new capabilities. In contrast, it's worth considering innovation clusters where the primary driver of clustering effects is the demand side. So rather than growing around a centre of excellence, innovation clusters often occur where there is a centre of demand. And I'm going to quote a, a statistic I was given by Microsoft, where you and I are sitting right now here in the, uh, in the fog, looking out of a dim shadow of London. We are within five minutes walk of 30% of the world's financial services IT budgets. Right. So the reason to come here to this cluster is that in this region, which according to the Milken Institute is the most productive in Europe, which according to the UK's Office for National Statistics is 72% more productive than the UK average, you will find 
that there is nowhere else on the surface of the earth where more of the key decision makers and more of the key budgets in financial services are on your doorstep and with with the ability to engage. Now, that's interesting because I'm senior enough and I... Uh, uh, with every respect, I suspect you maybe as well to remember when Bill Gates wrote in his first book that uh, all of this, uh, you know, the great big conglomeration of big buildings and things was going to go away. We'd all be working from our spare rooms. To be fair, that's exactly what I do. But I get from you that the physical presence somewhere is still a vitally important part of building a business. Could you elaborate on that a little? Well, certainly. And of course, the effect of networking technology have been transformational in many ways. They make it possible to discover a great deal of opportunity unbounded by geography. But I think it's too early to say that geography has ceased to matter. By bringing so many people from so many places with so many capabilities together uh, to address a relatively bounded set of big challenges in financial services, we find here that a great deal of the value that's created is essentially not on the direct path between origin and intended destination. There is a huge amount of serendipity in an environment like this. Uh, and it is the deliberate attempt to cultivate that sort of indirect value creation that we're able to contribute quite a lot to the development of companies. It's relatively simplistic to say that the challenges of developing a capability and applying it to a market are wholly solved by a well-developed technology pipe. You need particularly a group of trusted people around the supplier and the customer to help both to be confident in transacting with each other. And that is very hard to do without using geography. I, that's an interesting point. I remember, this is many years ago, I interviewed uh, the MD of Sage, the uh, accounting uh, software people. And uh, he was, th- at that stage, they were a, a fraction of what they are now. They, they just got to about 250 people. And the MD there was uh, trying to somehow formalize the idea of people who used to be able to bump into him in the corridor when there were about 60 of them and say, oh, I've got this idea. And he uh, was finding that with 200 on it, that wasn't happening anymore. And of course, now when that happens, so you have either the technology can facilitate that to an extent, but you've still got to have this uh, idea of bumping into people. And there was an awful lot of uh, you know shared environment out in, in the cafe places like that. And you have this members area as well, I know. So I do take an awful lot of um, the point you just made. Can you tell me a bit about uh, the companies that uh, work here and what stage they're at? I mean, you've mentioned they're primarily in the financial services area, or you, actually you said there were quite a few more areas than that. Uh, tell me a bit about your, your client group and the members. Well... Because our membership is so heavily influenced by the demand side, because so many people choose to come here from all over the world in order to engage with major global financial institutions, and we have 40 or so of those within a very short walk Mm. of here, it's perhaps most well-known as a fintech cluster. But we're also the largest cluster of cybersecurity companies in London. And that should be no surprise, because after all, the financial services industry is both a huge target for cyber criminals, cyber attack, and therefore a huge national security risk. It's a piece of critical national infrastructure. And um, while, of course, the public sector is often the first to gain access to advanced cybersecurity technology, the private sector sometimes considers in a way that that's a state responsibility. Uh, We are very keen to create conditions in which our most important economic institutions enjoy the best possible security protection and defense, because it's every one of our personal data as well as our financial well-being that's at stake. So in other words, we have here nearly 200 organizations that are increasing the productivity and performance of our most important companies and also increasing their security. And there are, of course, many that are also improving their ability to serve those who don't currently benefit from financial services to increase financial inclusion, education and engagement. It's an interesting point. You've mentioned the idea of it being a matter of national security, not in the government sense, but you know, a matter of security for our nation in many ways. I've been lucky enough to media train a couple of uh, security companies in the area. I'm not allowed to mention clients, but I would actually not so much challenge, but to, uh, expand on that point. It's international as well. Uh, very few of them uh, restrict their security operations to the UK. Some of them have got branches in America or you know, serve an awful lot of Europe. And by the time this goes out, of course, we will have left the European Union. Do you have any instinct, any effect that's likely to have on the businesses in here? 
Well, this is a community that is highly international, and I entirely agree that the global financial services firms in our immediate network are not only global in uh, in their own reach, but they're also global as potential distribution partners for the companies that are here. So many of the companies that are here in Level 39 are here precisely because their customers are global. So it's a fantastic way for a relatively small organization to achieve global impact. I think that that will be substantially unaffected by Brexit. The financial institutions, of course, have been preparing for the uh, many different possible permutations of Brexit for some time. And I think are broadly speaking, relatively well prepared. Now, there, I think, have been over the past year or so some indications of some slowing of demand as people prepare for a transition, uh, certainly during 2019, which looked somewhat unclear. I think that around this community, I certainly detect, there has been continued drive and ambition. Last year, some occasional frustration that decision cycles, buying cycles, where some parts of the market were slowing down a little bit, uh, momentum appears to be picking up again. Getting back to the idea of people clustering and uh, getting together, uh, many businesses, including my own startup training business, I'm assembling a little team, work without actual premises. They are sort of, uh, either, that, that's the way a great deal of people start up. It's the classic cliche of the kitchen table business. Obviously, that's not for everybody, but uh, what uh, would prompt companies to actually start to look at uh, going on premise, whether it's uh, in a cluster like this or whether it's uh, actually just an office? I ran my first business pretty much off the back of a motorbike. I was certainly an early believer that geography had ceased to matter. And now I find myself every day telling the story of the valuable role that geography here Mm -hmm. at Canary Wharf can play. Uh, And I would suggest that uh, it's not going to be the same for every company. Here are two things to consider. The first one I've mentioned, if your demand, if your prospective customers are clustered, well, it makes a very good deal of sense to be close to them. Not so much because it shortens the path between you and them, but because it helps them set you in context. I would suggest that with complex enterprise sales, and in financial services, the average sales cycle takes 18 months, anything you can do which builds that trust a little faster is enormously advantageous, particularly to the smaller company. 18 months is a very long time for a small early stage business to wait for a customer to come on board. And if we can cut that in half, we make a transformational difference to the prospects of companies that are here. And there is plenty of evidence to show that we can. We can increase people's ability to get to market. But there's a second thing that this does as well. And this applies beyond simply getting close to customers. It's worth considering what clustering does for your ability to recruit and retain and get best performance out of the team you're creating. And some people, of course, can operate very much on their own, very independent agents. But if you consider that anyone who's joining your team, let's say a CTO, Chief Technology Officer, joins you, they're actually going to be quite lonely Mm -hmm. in those early days. Even as they build a team working for them, who do they turn to for peer support? In an environment like this, there are 200 companies at a range of stages from minimum viable product and looking for customers right through to unicorn, which means you are never more than a few steps from somebody who has experience and expertise highly complementary to your own who can challenge you and just help you for, raise your game just for uh, listeners who aren't in necessarily in that particular loop uh, this lovely term unicorns arrived uh, fairly recently what, what is your definition of it because i'm convinced i hear different definitions from everybody who mentions it well uh, thank you for pointing that out i guess uh, a unicorn is um, popularly described as a company worth more than a billion dollars right i don't think that it's something that every company should aspire to Uh, And it's not necessarily a real indicator of long-term value or potential. But certainly here we have companies at every stage from minimum viable product, companies that at least have developed some technology right through to globally successful organizations. So there is a fantastic variety of organizations and stages to learn from. You're based in Canary Wharf, and obviously it's it, it's terrific. I love the building, and I, you know you've got amazing facilities here. But it's got to be um, it, that will obviously come as a cost. So I mean, perhaps you could tell me about the services that uh, your clients actually get here, apart from the obvious bumping into each other in the corridor, which they could do at a WeWork or something like that. You know, all of that could happen over there. But I imagine there's more to it than that. When we began seven years ago, I think for many people, Canary Wharf was seen as a place where big institutions would go to base themselves. And Canary Wharf, of course, was created really in response to an earlier stage of financial technology. As the following Big Bang in the 1980s, 
the scope for banks to create vast trading floors uh, became apparent. But the old medieval street pattern of the city of London made that very hard to organize practically. This disused dock represented an opportunity to create buildings like this amazing 1.2 million square foot tower, globally iconic, but also a fantastic place to bring together that generation of financial technology. But that was some time ago now, and new technologies and new working styles are developing. So I think it's worth considering how we can make sure that we as Canary Wharf Group continue to provide a fit environment for the best performing businesses of all. Now, history shows, and the Milken Institute indeed has, has measured this, that uh, this is the most productive region in Europe. Mm. And in order to make sure that we extend that advantage, make sure that the organizations here continue to play their part in building our economy, it's very important, I guess, that we pay close attention to helping people perform to their best. To answer your question, we do that not only by bringing people together, but by acknowledging these network effects, by making sure that whatever critical path they need to be on, that we help them to make that path as short as possible, to make sure that as they travel that path, they are supported from every side by people whose expertise and interests increase the chances of success. In practice, that means not only, as you've mentioned, the serendipitous encounters that happen here, but also a whole range of measures to make sure that not only customers, but also investors, regulators, policymakers, communicators, international contacts are all closely engaged here. And of course, you stamp your feet in level 39 and the 26 professors at University College School of Management uh, will hear you as well. So we are closely engaged with academia too. You skirted around my next question, or you led me into my next question, I could perhaps say, which is how you actually keep pace with innovation. If you told me, say, 25 years ago, when I'd been freelance for some time, it, and I was already writing about technology. But if you told me at that stage when I could have all my information in my pocket, in fact, most of the world's information on the same device I'm using to record this podcast and that I would then be going and broadcasting it to the world from my spare room at home, supported by a dual screen setup, but most importantly, all for the sort of price a consumer rather than a corporation could afford. That would have seemed an impossible dream to me. I'd have quite probably worried about you uh, and your sense of reality. And of course, that's exactly what's happened. How can an organization like this stay ahead or competitive as the world becomes more technologized and we just take this for granted? I think this is such a fascinating question. And many people assume that when they come to level 39, they will hear conversations about finance and technology and relentless march of progress. In fact, if you listen to the people around you here, you find that conversations remain as they have been probably um, from the very beginning of conversation, primarily about relationships primarily about trust. And yes, of course, technology has advanced in leaps and bounds in the 25 years you've mentioned. But the extent to which people do business based on trust, rather than simply a relentless supply of data, I think is largely unchallenged. This, in other words, is not actually a place primarily preoccupied with creating technology. It's a place primarily preoccupied with creating trust. Yes, and of course, uh, people, as it's been put to me a number of times, people buy from people rather than by, you know, you can uh, use the phone, you can use the uh, networks on that. But if, you've, if you haven't got the viable product and if you haven't got uh, the ability to inspire that uh, confidence and trust and enjoy, enjoy the process, hopefully, then you, uh, you, you might as well not bother. So I do uh, take that. I do, do, do take that point. Now, I've seen research from companies like Poly, formerly um, Polycom and uh, Plantronics, that suggest this is within the last year. They're now suggesting we took a massive wrong turn into this dreadful blind alley when we all started using open plan offices in the 80s and 90s. It turns out that we need a bit of seclusion according to their uh, research and they don't sell office space so I do take them relatively seriously that they've, they're have they taking an independent view. How do we know that models like this one are going to deliver in the longer term? I mean, it's been seven years, that's, uh, you know, we, we've seen companies like WeWork uh, have question marks over their future and, uh, you know, risk administration in that time. Why is this, uh, well, why is your faith so much in this particular model? Well, I don't think we should take anything for granted. I would observe, for example, that the very often the people who make noise are not the same people who deliver innovation. And especially in disciplines in cybersecurity, for example, it's very clear that one needs to make provision for people who are neurodiverse to thrive. There is a, a tendency often in 
the, the sort of the innovation commentary. Sorry, I will just pause you there to uh, explain the term neurodiverse, where, uh, because it, it may be a piece of jargon not everybody will understand. We're talking about people with uh, uh, perhaps on the autism spectrum and various other what we would perceive as challenges. There's a whole movement to embrace people from those worlds um, and or from those cultures, perhaps. And that's what you're talking about, yeah? Well, certainly, uh, I think it's fairly clear that you need a variety of different people and different types of people, whether that type is a, is a measure of, of people's position on an autistic spectrum, uh, or, or indeed uh, other types of diversity, including, of course, gender diversity uh, and uh, other ways in which people identify themselves. We need to create conditions where everyone has the best possible chance of thriving on their own terms. And this really matters. For example, there are studies which show that on average, and averages, of course, conceal a huge spread, but on average, men and women prefer different temperatures in offices, which leaves one with a really difficult question. What temperature should you choose? Should you try to make everyone equally uncomfortable? Should you have an area which is slightly more uh, attuned towards the preferences of women and another for men? Um, we are constantly exploring and experimenting and discussing this. So I don't pretend we have all the answers, but we at least have some of the questions. I think there's a particular danger in innovation environments to gravitate towards what's sometimes described as bro culture approach, which seems to expect that uh, innovation comes in the form of a theatrical discipline, the ability in a pithy 30 second summary to provide a dazzling insight into the business or technology you're developing. And of course, the ability to stand on a stage and dazzle someone for 30 seconds is not in any obvious way correlated with the ability to understand complex challenges of finance and technology, or indeed to deliver solutions to those challenges. So we have been careful to take out the podium on which, when you last came here, people used to explain what they're going to do and create an environment instead, which is not designed to bias people towards supporting middle-class white male extroverts. And I have been heavily informed by this in research done by Professor Laura Huang, who has written both at Harvard and at Wharton about the way in which the demo day culture of innovation specifically reinforces a whole cluster of biases, reducing investment in businesses led by women, by people with ethnic minority backgrounds, or indeed people who don't match a particular habitual pattern of a Silicon Valley founder. It's not unique to technology, this, is it? I mean, I don't want to get party political in any way on any national or international level, but there is, has been a tendency for showboaters, uh, for people who are really very good with the camera, to achieve extreme prominence when that's not the same thing as being able to get down in a negotiating situation or to get down and actually run a country. I, mean, it is, I, I think perhaps this is a, a culture, as you just put put that we could actually benefit from putting through the whole of society if at all possible just get someone who's good at doing the job and if that doesn't make them the person to stand up and be the spokesperson that's not not necessarily a dreadful thing well i'd like to just point out what i believe to be the limit of our mandate here mm -hmm. so i believe it's my role and the role of my team to create conditions for people to play their best part it is not however for me to say you should be getting more and you should not I think we should acknowledge that there is a role for extroverted performers, people who can provide succinct summaries, and we should probably close, pay close attention to the effects, positive and negative, that they achieve. Who you choose to vote for, of course, is a very private decision. Uh, and, of course, who you choose to buy from is perhaps equally private. And my aim is to make sure that anyone who comes here, wherever they come from, has the best possible chance of, su of succeeding on their own terms. And we diminish rather than increasing the success of a cluster like this. If we point ourselves as the picker of winners or the moral arbiters, we must create conditions in which that contest must be properly open and neutral. In terms of the workplace, you'll have seen a lot of changes in the seven years that place has been running and the four years that uh, you've been at its helm. What sort of innovations are you expecting over the next few years? Well, I think um, one of the aware that somebody may play this back to you in a few years' time and say, you were expecting such and such. <laughs> Don't let me put you off. <laughs> well, I, I'm prepared to take that risk. Please do remind me of what I'm about to say. I'll tell you what I hope as well as what I believe, and the two do overlap. But of course, that means I could be very susceptible to confirmation bias, to wish thinking. I believe that there is plenty of scope for a reconciliation between 
some of the better and some of the less attractive consequences of innovation. And I think we collectively may often tend, those of us who are closely involved in innovation, to neglect the downsides, to forget that not everybody benefits equally from innovation. And it is probably overall a good thing that innovation drives progress. And it's probably overall an acceptable cost that that progress arrives at different rates for different people. But I think that the moment we lose touch with the society that gives us our right to exist and to operate, the moment we lose that social license to operate, we are on thin ice. And I don't think we should dismiss quickly the voices of those who succinctly point out that we must reconnect and re-earn that right. And if, like 50% of the population, you've seen no increase in your real income for a generation, I think it's understandable you might feel a bit sceptical. Mm. or even cynical about the protestations of people like me, people in places like this, that yes. what we're doing is good for everybody. We must make sure it is. Yes, I've written um, and studied a lot about robotic process automation, that sort of thing, and you know, artificial intelligence. We've run quite a few of the podcasts on that subject. And the answer almost always is, uh, yes, it'll take away the boring stuff, uh, you know, the tedious tasks, which I fully accept is true. But I'm lucky enough that I'm not, dependent on my livelihood for some of those, uh, you know, tedious. I'm not dependent for my livelihood on some of those tedious tasks is what I meant to uh, say. And uh, that I recognize as a privilege in many ways. And, uh, you know, if I were that dependent, I might well feel differently about uh, the tedium being taken away. Is that the sort of thing you're talking about, you know, having to address those needs and bring people with us as well as those of us who are able to move or better able to move with the times? Is that the sort of thing you're talking about. Well, I think that's a part of it. Certainly for many people, their first experience of a new technology is when it threatens their job yep. or threatens the security of their job or threatens the integrity of the society in which they feel safe and comfortable or possibly introduces biases into processes like the political process they depend upon or introduces hostility into their social life. And so I don't think that we should forget that technology and the change that it brings about is always good. And neither should we forget that simply winning a technical or an economic argument doesn't win hearts, doesn't win a right to continue. We've got to get better. And we've got to understand that, that some people whose messages you may not like, whose way of communicating you may not like, may still have an important truth, which is the message must be palatable to the audience. It must earn the right to be heard even. Uh, and one of the sometimes sort of described as a filter bubble effect, is that it's very easy to find people who agree with you. It's much harder to find people who don't and earn the right, not to convert them to your way of life, but to earn the right to continue. Because we are rather dependent on each other and the mutuality which underpins our society and makes it possible for great clusters like this is fragile. We must not take it for granted. We must continue to invest in it and to earn it. We could go on talking about this for quite some time, but uh, I think uh, we should uh, let the listeners have their, the rest of their day back. Uh, but perhaps you could uh, round off, uh, if I were to ask you, if people want to find out more about uh, either yourself or Level 39, where should they go? Well, you can find out more about Level 39 by coming here, meeting one of the amazing companies that's here. Um, you can find out more on our website at level39.co. You can find out about us on Twitter at level39cw. And you can find out about me at on Twitter at Ben Brabin, which is B-E-M-B-R-A-B-Y-N. Ben Brabin, Level 39, thank you very much for joining me. And many thanks to you for listening. That was the Near Futurist podcast with me, Guy Crapperton. Don't forget to have a look at the website at nearfuturist.co.uk. As always, I'll be back in two weeks' time. 